Hi folks, this is Jason Framus. I'm executive editor of Dig Boston and welcome to the second episode of uh, our Better Boston Art Series. And today, uh, it's, uh, let's see, uh, Thursday and it's August 27th, 2020. Uh, I'm going to be interviewing Callie Chapman, who's the director and pro uh, program manager of Studio at 550 in Central Square, Cambridge. So let me just bring her on and we'll get started. Okay, how are you doing, Kelly? Welcome to the show. So, Hi. yeah. Um, and um, for those of you that don't know, this series is, is uh, kind of uh, going to be going on for a while. And I'm asking uh, people that are active in the Boston area art scene, broadly writ, all kinds of arts, uh, not just visual art, like, but everything, music, dance, you know, whatever people consider art, um, how, how they think um, we can build a better art scene coming out of the disaster that is the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, when the art scene and all the scenes that make it up uh, were already in trouble for a variety of reasons, which I know Kelly's going to touch on um, prior to the pandemic starting. So, but first, let's, you know, Kelly, um, uh, who are you? Who, who is Kelly Chapman? <laughs> like, kind of a classic <laughs> showbiz question, you know, and then uh, why don't you tell us something about, you know, Studio at 550? Yeah, hi, um, my name is Callie Chapman, um, director of Studio 550, as Jason said. I wear many hats, as right. artists typically do. Um, started out as a dancer, choreographer, moved uh, into video stuff. We're going to call it just that because it's a blend of a whole bunch of other disciplines, including you know projection design and all the rest of it. And also, I'm an arts administrator. Um, working in the Boston scene for about 15 years or so, um, and a performer. Um, danced with a company called Prometheus Dance for about 20 years, have my own dance company called Zoe Dance, um, and just a huge arts advocate, um, mostly, right. <laughs> to get things to work. <laughs> Great. <laughs> um, so that's kind of where I'm coming from in all those different hats. Awesome. And so um, what is Studio at 550? Studio 550 started and continues to be um, in the future a multidisciplinary arts center where our objective is to connect artists either with artists of other disciplines or encourage the fostering of exchanging the disciplines within in their own practice. Um, uh, we've had before the pandemic over 20 classes a week, mostly uh -huh. movement classes, but some theater classes and some experimental um, movement slash sound classes at the space and um, offer, we used to offer <laughs> <laughs> affordable artist rental um, that needed like this, this, I'm in the space right now, it's about a thousand square feet. Oh wow. Um, yeah. I've been there at least once, but yeah. And so um, what was it like for that, you know, enterprise, um, community enterprise, you know, prior to the pandemic, like how are things going, you know, as, as the pandemic came on, was it easy? Like, you know, had it become like a regular thing, money was coming in, you're paying, you know, you're paying your lease, you're, rent, you're renting the space and all this. How was it? Um, so we started about four years ago. So if you are familiar with any kind of like business, you know, yes. trajectory of how long things are. <laughs> You know, Typically, it takes five years to be a thing. You know, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It, takes, <coughs> it was starting to feel that way. Great. Ah. Kind of like Dig Boston. <laughs> almost. Perhaps. Right. Yeah, it's like, uh, yeah. yeah it's like it's like oh my god, I can almost breathe. Not not quite breathe yet, but like right. almost breathe. Wow. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and not only the pandemic, we also had you know developer wants to build things in the space issues as well. So before the pandemic, before the pandemic, right? Ah. A thousand square feet is not that big either. So, you know, well, depends on who you talk to, right? There's been some people like, uh, invested in the art scene, but more visual art scene. And they say to me, wow, that's big. And I'm like, <laughs> actually, if you lay out like this with your leg, it's actually not that big. You put 10 people in a room, forget about it. Right, exactly. You can't move. <laughs> you can't move. This is actually quite small for a movement. Space. Yes, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's what I was, that's what I was saying. And I, 
<laughs> I, uh, I understand that implicitly having, you know, e even doing visual arts, which doesn't always involve movement, although it can, you know, uh, the studio that I actually want, you know, for photography and multimedia work and other stuff oh. that I do is, is s something like the size of my current apartment at a measly 600 square feet. And thousand square feet is only 400 square feet more than that. And you're putting in, as you say, 10 people at once, this kind of stuff moving. It's got to be hard. Um, but so then the pandemic hits and what happens with the situation? Zero yeah. income. Yes. Yay. Yes, we also had that experience <laughs> and, in Boston. Yeah. yeah, like all of a sudden, like I only had one week, one week of people who had rented, you know, prior when I said, okay, March was it, 18th or something like that. Okay, we're closing. Had our last class, like that is it, everybody out. Right. I only had that next week of collecting payment for the previous week and then nothing. Wow. Nothing so, at so. all without any, any kind of like, any, like notice, right? We, we didn't have any notice. So I couldn't go like saving money somewhere, you know, not right. that I had money to save, <coughs> but <laughs> it's just, you couldn't plan for it. Right. That's um, right. Yeah. So that was unfortunate. Uh, Timing for everything, of course. Uh, well, how big is the community that you're serving? I mean, how many people have plugged into the to the studio? Uh, like, like by that point, you know, are we talking dozens or more? Yeah, depending on how you look at it, because my list of people who have rented is something like 700 and something people. Wow. Right. Yeah. Um, and then our mailing list is about <laughs> 1,200 something. Right. People that are interested. Now, I don't have access to any, like the people that used to rent here for classes, they had their own students. I didn't have access to their students because they're the ones who kept track of that. I, I did not. I just rented the space. They held their classes. So if you think about 20 classes a week and, you know, let's say average five, ten people per class, you can do the math there. Yeah. And it's exponential and they're not always regular students so that there was like some students that would come this week but not that week and then the other ones would come but there's still 10 people there right so who knows how i've tried to do the numbers and i can only guess it's like, a big just, community this is what it sounds like community. to me you know yeah uh, it's it's at least the size of our you know boston institute for nonprofit journalism which is a nonprofit my colleagues and i also run is about the same size in terms of mailing list right and that's taken five years to build about exactly the same as, as you all so, I mean, it's a lot. And so all of a sudden you're broke and all of a sudden, not only are you broke, but you're a public facing enterprise and you can't have the public there anymore. So what, what was your response? Like, what have you been, what have you been doing? You know? <laughs> so I always joke with my friends when I get nervous, I build websites. Oh, there you go. <laughs> so, <laughs> Cause I don't know where to hold the information and if no one's looking, no one knows about it. So I could just be a failure and it's fine <laughs> until I tell people to go and get, you know, go to the website. So I started a website that was already on the back burner anyway, called artist2, with the number two, artist.org. Right. Um, it was supposed to be, originally it was supposed to be an artist networking site where um, like two years ago I had the idea and the idea was first, hey, people can't get in contact with the artists of other disciplines. Why don't we create a place, a networking space portal, so these people can find each other. Yeah. So for instance, dance artists are always like, I need a lighting designer, do you know anybody? And I'm like, yeah, all the lighting designers I know are booked. You know, like, because we all use the same people, so why right. not try to explain, expand those bubbles into reaching up into other, um, oops, sorry. That's okay, <laughs> Discipline. you're still there. <laughs> the camera. You, can, yeah. you can move it back, um, you know, or whatever. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that was started as that and it, you know, it's slow to get off the ground with no money and it was kind of a side project. And then as soon as the pandemic hit, I was like, okay, everybody's doing online classes. Oh, why don't we just integrate online classes into the website? That makes so much sense. Right. So then I started a place for listing all online classes that, that focus on greater Boston area as a center point. Because when you, there is a, another website, I can't remember. Oh, dancingalonetogether.org. And that's an international website that right. does the same thing. It's an aggregate. That. Yeah. Um, and that's great, except I really like dancing with people that I know. 
<laughs> you know, I really do. I love taking the, you know, I'll take some class from San Francisco and that's great, but I don't know these people yet, you know, and then you just see them and it, there's no interpersonal relationships. So the objective was to connect people with the people they already know so that they feel a, a better, you know, stronger community um, while they're at in their own small little houses yeah. trying to do dance yeah. class, which is almost impossible. I've seen um, people doing it. I assume you have, you know, where you try to do yeah. full body green screen stuff or whatever, you know. Yeah, it's yeah. it's hard. I mean, we've it's you hard. know we've been doing classes online ourselves through our nonprofit and journalism. You know, the same kind of thing that were supposed to be brick and mortar classes in Somerville, yeah. you know, as part of our Somerville News Garden project, you know, yeah. where we're, we're trying to, um, uh, uh, re well, rebuild the shattered news infrastructure in one city as an experiment, you know, to see if that can be done in an era when we desperately need certainly local news and news in general. But anyway, I'm not enough about me. Um, so, <laughs> no, that's good. But, but, but I, I, I dig it. So, uh, and not just because we're called dig, but um, so, so, all right. Um, Good response. Um, um, you know, you know, and I'm not gonna like ask you like how you're paying rent or not paying rent or whatever. That's you know up to you to, to discuss. <laughs> yeah. But um, moving over to our sort of the main subject here, and, and we're trying to be a little bit positive. The, the pandemic's going to end, Kelly. <laughs> so mm -hmm. at some point, you know, uh, hopefully by next year. You know, knock whatever, wood whatever, um, and. Um, um, I don't think, you know, it's, it's been my thought that we don't want to just go back to the way things were before the pandemic because the art scene was in trouble. We've, we've lost, just in terms of spaces like yours, space after space after space after space, including in Central Square, you know, and um, uh, all kinds of venues, right? And it's, it's yeah. badly affected the art scene. And a lot of this is because the real estate industry, you know, has just been running amok, essentially. Um, they've been making hay while the sun shines. They're, there's been a lot of biotech money and other money's coming into town. There's strong education, higher education sector. And they're like, people want to live here. We want to give them places to live and charge as much as possible. And we don't care what happens to like people that might have been using the spaces for something else, say a multidisciplinary art center in Central Square. So, you know, that said, um, you know, where do you think we should be going? You, you, you wrote a little bit about this for us, for Dick Boston, uh, for this coming members edition this week. And it will also be online, but please, you know, extemporize. Yeah. Um, so, first off, um, I think I, I don't want to say I'm blaming it on the artist at all, but it would help. There, there's two sides of things. Developers can do whatever they want. Yeah. Mostly. Right now. Within yeah. re I mean, within <clears throat> legal reason, right? They could just be like, "That's a building. I like that. I can build a quick, fast buck with it." let's do it and they do it and it's great um there's also this factor that comes into play where why are the areas desirable right what what is that desirable and so be you know well, I think my friend called it the bohemian index <laughs> i mean like, you know the richard it? It was hip <laughs> you know the richard florida answer right i mean this is like yeah, yeah, yeah. what one does <laughs> you you make you make a neighborhood nice you know yeah. um you know meaning white but we'll be quiet about that part of it you know richard florida you know and um by bringing in lots of artists and making things exciting yeah. and interesting and then we'll shove them out when we've done that you know maybe keep a, a couple of pet ones or have some public right. art you know right but it only lasts for so long right. and then it dies off and it's boring and they're banks and there's no art and there's no right. culture and you know, then the area moves to this other place. And, and yeah. it's a cycle that we could prevent <laughs> by keeping the actual funky, cool things that exist to make it funky and cool in place. Yeah. Um, it's where I went as a teenager, that, you know. Yeah. Central right. Square. But it, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. Um, I, there's something to say about keep, making sure that the artists understand their power in that, number one. <clears throat> um, that is one of my priorities is to like, you know, financially, maybe we don't make a million dollars off what we do, right. but that shouldn't be our, uh, gauge as to our worth. Um, of course our worth is much more than that. Um, but when other people start measuring in that financial sense, there shouldn't be like, well, I don't make so much money. So like, you know, I, I'm poor. 
It's more that you make other people money. Wait a second, hold up. You make other people money because you're bringing, you're attracting all the people that are interested in what you're doing. So I can give you kind of a, for instance, not that you would need one, but maybe watchers, Our, listeners would. Yeah, yeah <laughs> viewers in viewer land, yes. Viewer, yes. Viewers in viewer land <laughs> would. Um, so recently I heard that the field which is over on Prospect near Mass Ave. An Irish closing. pub. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, what's next to the field? Uh, well, a theater. A theater. You know, Improv Boston's right next door. Mm -hmm. Huh. Do you think there's any connection between mm -hmm. those two things? I wonder. Probably, you know, like. Probably. <laughs> and, can, and CCTV used to be across the street for quite a few years. Uh, the, the, this is the Cambridge Mass uh, public access station, folks. Yeah. Uh, and it moved, it moved not far away, but that was also there, and, and perhaps the pub was there for that reason as well. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, to make that connection, I think, is that's where the work is right now. Um, it's to kind of make, okay, fine. I, I was at a meeting once. Um, it was one of those meetings that you get invited to when you're director of something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, from like, yeah. You know, it was like a cultural facilities, something or another. Cool. There was a lawyer there, and I was spouting out about, you know, what happens with nomadic arts? You know, like what happens when, when artists are kind of like always moving around, because that's what we do sometimes. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we stay, but sometimes we just like move around, and that's fine. <coughs> and we shouldn't have to quantify, you know, our stability in order to get money to do art. You know, like, no, that's the whole thing we're not doing, and that's why it's cool, because right, it's right. moving around. Um, and I was trying to explain that. To half of the circle, I felt understood because they're grassroots organizations, and then the other half were more of the establishment. And I'm not talking like huge organizations. I'm just saying that they have permanency in some way. And then there's some lawyers and the rest of them are nothing. And after I said that, the lawyer guy kind of folded his arms, rocked back, and was like, "Well, then you have to learn how to speak our language." Uh, and I was like, "I guess I don't know your language." English? Um, I, don't, I don't know. I know, like, I don't know. The any, he, and then he went on about permanency and securing arts facilities and long term. And yeah, it makes a difference. But what about the, the people that are already doing the thing? Like, yeah. what, what happens to them? You know, and why can't we secure for that time period of five years or whatever it is, give them money to do the thing? They're doing a great job at it. You know, they're now, calling people. What kind of money are you talking about here? You wrote about this a little bit, but. Well, in that instance, it was state money, and that's yeah. really hard to get. It, it <laughs> it's is. inaccessible it is. to most of us. Um, right. I, have, I don't have a big enough budget to even apply half the time. Yeah. I don't. I've been to meetings, and they're like, sorry, you're not applicable, but these guys at Emerson, and these guys at Harvard, and these guys at MIT can apply. I'm like, wait a second, but they're in institutions. You know, like, I don't understand yeah. that. Well, Dang. they're black holes. They, right. you know, money breeds money, right? So they have a ton of money, and they they have this gravitational force that sucks in more money because they're a good bet, yeah. right? But yeah. it's not yeah. where everybody goes to get their art fix, is it? You know? Nope. Nor should it be. <laughs> you know? No. Um, but, you know, that's there. So I feel like, you know, min municipalities, particularly, you know, cities and whatnot, have a little bit more, it's like once you bring something down to the local level, mm -hmm. I feel they have a little bit more uh, responsibility yeah. <laughs> to yeah. maintain their communities <clears throat> and maintain them in the way that it's of interest of the people who live there, the people that work there, the tourism factor. I mean, we can talk about that as well, yes. where you're not actually making money with the people that live down the street. You're actually making money with the people that come to your neighborhood to spend money. So, you know, we have to talk about the, the counselors, you know, sometimes only see past the neighbors, but like, what about that other factor of tourism? Um, Cambridge City Council, that, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, yeah, their city, city council, council is what their town, job is. Town meeting, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, but, um, you know, there's that. Um, so one of the things I have, you know, I've been listening for a lot of years in terms of like what has been spoken about as possible incentives to create better culture planning, like cultural planning in cities. And one of them is, you know, 
why don't we offer a tax abatement to landlords who rent to nonprofits? Like that right. was one of the, the asking points that I'll talk about it later. I have put it together a petition that will go out on Math Creative very, yes. very soon. Please do talk about that. Um, we like an action step in these things. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that was one of the things that was thrown around when Green Street Studios, which was over at 186, 186, 185. Ooh, can't remember the address. I think it's Green Street. Yeah. 186 Green Street sounds right um, me, in Cambridge and Central Square. Um, when they were having trouble with their landlord who bought their building at an exorbitant price and then mm -hmm. started to try to charge them like 20 grand a month or something like that. Yeah. Um, and then they were like, <coughs> yeah, we can't afford that. Sorry. Um, so that was on the table in terms of like somebody's thought. And then it was brought up a couple years back. I think it probably was EMF. Who knows? Um, EMF well. being a, you know, music studios yeah. that the same thing happened to. They were happily ensconced in this building uh, and had been for years. And then, and then you know, I, I forget if it was the same landlord or a new landlord, but, you know, comes in and is like, ah, I'm going to make this into fancy condos. And threw everybody yeah, out and did that. labs. <laughs> lab space is what he did with it. I went over uh, and looked at it. I thought, okay, cool. Yeah, lab they kept space. the logo, which is funny. Yeah, the little the little lightning thing. Yeah, it was. It's still there. It had been an electronics manufacturing, so I mean, it it made I some know. sense. But okay, I know. so yeah, I and know. that that tossed out I don't know dozens and dozens of people. Um, yep. Yeah, um, yeah, lots, lots actually. Um, so you know, like, what are the incentives? What are the policies? What are the zoning? You know, things we can put in place to keep incentivizing because that's that's where we are right now with a capitalist society in, in a way yes you can't, I've heard. Yes. <laughs> you can't be like okay state give us lots of money like because that's not going to happen anytime soon um you're going to have to incentivize the people that own the power mm. of the land that you want right and that means maybe throwing some tax credits in there or whatever it else it is it doesn't matter what it is just something to say, hey, if you keep these nonprofits there, we can give you this. Or we'll... And it can't just be, oh, like, here's a closet artist, use that, you know, because that's not helpful to most anybody. Right. Um, right. So there needs to be some sort of oversight to say, that's appropriate to give, that's not appropriate to give. Like, <laughs> you know, those incentives have to be vetted. Um, especially by the community to say, yeah, they're actually helpful or no, they're not. Um, let's move in another direction. And do you think that there's role for direct protest by artists as well? I mean, is there a point to that? Um, there is a tradition of that in the Boston area. I mean, there was a Boston artist union, you know, in the seventies that was pretty militant. I was part of an effort to try to restart something like that about five years ago called mass creative mm -hmm. workers. But we, you know, it, organizing, uh, Politically organizing artists is much like herding cats and about as effective. So, I mean, that's one problem on the artist side. Um, and that's that's on us as artists to deal with. Right. But then there's the other problem of of um, extra parliamentary politics. Like, is it is it effective? Is it necessary? You know, I would say, yeah, at least in some situations it's necessary. But who's the target, I guess, here? If you're going to protest but, what I mean, aside from protesting capital. Well, and, and I mean, like, yeah. So, th so capitalism is a problem, probably not going to solve the problems with that overnight. And probably a series of protests in one city is not going to change that. You know, we're not going to suddenly not have landlords or whatever. So then, you know, where are the pressure points? And there's a lot of answers to that question. I just don't know if you've, if you've been down that road much or would like to go down it again, if so, or what? Yeah. I mean, I personally am not a big, I mean, I haven't been, that doesn't mean I can't uh, be protesting. I mean, the only form of a process I ever did, which was not really much of anything, was uh, when Green Street was closing, we yeah. had a, uh, a walk around the block in the pouring rain and people came out. It was yeah. beautiful. But like, come on. Um, yeah. yeah. There is something to say when you listen to city council meetings, and I'm not saying the city is responsible for everything. Right. They're not. I right. mean, it's just a part of an, an ecosystem system that, work, that works or doesn't if you notice all the people that are speaking out there are a lot of them over 70 mm -hmm. and there are a lot of people that are speaking <coughs> out and they're really they're older people not that they have not you know 
they're valid in their concerns, but they come from a generation or they've learned enough to, to think about like, hey, if I say something, at least there's something, you know, that could be done. If mm-hmm. I don't say anything, there's nothing, you know, yeah. there's nothing, there's no voice. So I think it's worth uplifting the voices of the artists to articulate exactly why, you know, they need support. Yeah. There's nothing, there's nothing wrong with that right. at all. Now, it's, the trick is getting them to call, well, right now it's call in because they're on Zoom, um, call in to public comment. Yeah. That's super scary. During Cambridge That's City the Council, they have the public comment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Definitely. Yeah. And I mean, legislators do hear this, you know, um, uh, at various levels, including city politicians. You know, like if there's, there's a couple things that get politicians to move, at least legally. You know, there's, well, or quasi-legally, money in, the, in that case, right, which usually does the talking, and then constituents that vote these people in, right? So if you get enough of them calling up, they're going to start to get nervous, and, and, uh, and they may be sympathetic anyway, and perhaps do something. But again, you know, what is the something? Like, for, in, your, in, your, in the piece, you, in, the, in the, uh, the text you wrote for, for the Better Boston Arts column I'll be putting out next week, um, you know, you mentioned uh, the fact that Central Square is a, is a cultural district, and that's a state designation. Is that right? So, so there's another level of politics that we need to think about, right? If we're trying to get something out of somebody, right? Uh, but, but that doesn't deliver much right now. It's kind of just a name, a brand, like, hey, we're a cultural district. But as you said yeah. in your writing, like, that doesn't mean a landlord can't jack the rent. You know, and do something else with the space. It's their right; they own it. So, um, yeah. you know, is there anything that could be done at that level to make a cultural district more than just a brand? Yeah, I mean, that's the that's a question. I mean, to be considered as a cultural district, there's certain criteria that you have to fill, mm-hmm. and Central Square had fulfilled that criteria <clears throat> because of its nature, not because it was supported, just yeah. because of its nature and its history and its legacy. Um, it's starting to go away. So could yeah. they lose that designation? Maybe, you know. Does it matter? I mean, I don't know. I, yeah, well, that's true. Yeah, that is yeah. a threat. I mean, if you don't maintain a certain <clears throat> level of, you know, we have this many cultural <clears throat> organizations, then what happens after that? It becomes a cultural district because there's a mural on a wall across the street, right. which is great. That's great. We like the murals. Like... Does, does the muralist actually work here now? No. <laughs> or more importantly, well, not more importantly, but also live in the area. I live mean, there. I, <laughs> when, I, when I moved to Central Square as a kid, you know, in uh, uh, late 86, early 87, and I'd been hanging, I, I was, what, nine, uh, let me think, 20. I just turned 20. Uh, but I'd been hanging out in, you know, around Central and Harvard Squares. Harvard Square is much different, too, in the 80s, you know, since about 82-ish, you know, when I was a younger teenager. And um, uh, it was cheap in Central Square. I mean, you know, we still had rent control at that time, too, which younger people like me could not avail ourselves of. It was all the rent control units were locked up, which was another problem. But um, overall, it was a lot cheaper in the area. And so... You went there, it was like everything was kind of run down, but you could get space. I, I lived in a, well, I guess, a commune that put out Street Magazine, the, uh, the first homeless publication in the U.S., as far as we're aware, that let the homeless sell it. In our case, the mm. business model wasn't that smart. We let the homeless keep all the money. So, you know, so we were, and we were in this brownstone that wasn't zoned for housing, but we squatted it, you know. And then when um, uh, the owners of the property decided to uh, uh, tear it down to, to make a parking lot, um, uh, for uh, the food co-op at that time, among other things, um, we we had a party and destroyed the place ourselves. Um, although uh, I was in, well, this is a long story. I'm I'm, I'm getting off track. The point is just that um, uh, Central Square was cheap, and therefore people that didn't have much money, including a lot of artists, could live there. And we did. You know, mm-hmm. um, I was more of a writer then than anything else, but same deal. You know, uh, and now that's that's not the case at all. Um, so, I mean, I, I, and I mean, I'm not going to talk about the federal level. I mean, that's a whole other can of worms. Um, and I, I don't know what one would do there. Um, there's, there's big money there. But especially right now, I don't know how one would leverage it. I, and I don't know if it's even been taken off the table by the Trump administration and minions. Yeah. But um, let's return to the city level. You, you have a petition. What, what is the mm-hmm. petition? What do you want to do? 
Um, there are a couple things in the petition um, that we have. One is there's a, well, there was something on the table mid-July, late July, um, to use the Mayor's Disaster Relief Fund for nonprofit arts organizations that couldn't do programming. <laughs> so this is a very different, this is a very specific thing that although the city decided to use the Mayor's Disaster Relief Fund for nonprofits, right. the nonprofits had to be emergency relief efforts right. um, focused. Right. So they had to be able to operate in some way. And that means that arts and culture organizations could qualify, but they had to actually do something to get the money. Um, whereas like I couldn't actually operate because if I decided to rent space, first of all, I didn't feel safe doing it because I didn't know enough. Like personally, I'm not a health professional or anything. So how would I be supposed to know what's safe, what's not? Right. Second of all, it would cost me too much to clean in between <coughs> each renter that I would actually operate at a loss and I can't afford to do that. Right. 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 Um, so I'm one of a couple of organizations, especially in Central Square right now, that like Improv Boston is also the other one, that they cannot operate because if they try to at safe levels, whatever that may mean, it's, they're not gonna be able to. <laughs> like it's just it's, it's like throwing money in the hole that you don't even have. So right. how does that work? It doesn't. So this um, order which was put on the table late July, mid-July, I can't remember, somewhere in there, um, at the city council meeting was supposed to allow nonprofit arts organizations to access the money, the same as restaurants were already accessing. They right. got grants. Um, and other types of small businesses were also accessing. Um, <clears throat> and when it came time for a roll call, a certain counselor decided that she would use her charter right, which basically means uh, that she wants to table yes the vote until the next meeting. Well, mm -hmm. since it was summer session, the next meeting happened <laughs> to be September 14th. What a shock, yeah. I've never seen that happen oh, in Cambridge dear. before. Yeah. That, I know, I was like, what's going on? <laughs> so, yeah, that's kind of hurtful. Um, mm -hmm. And the counselor's concerns, you know, she didn't address them in the meeting at all, um, which was unfortunate because <laughs> maybe they could have been answered. Um, there are certain other counselors that were very much champions of the arts and they could have answered that because she, they're actually engaged with us <laughs> in some way. I mean, this is all on the public record. You are, of course, free to say who the oh, counselor yeah. is, but you know, whatever, <laughs> it's up to you. Yeah, I don't, I mean, you, you know, don't have we to. can leave it at that. I, I can, as a journalist, I can talk about it. As, so. Yeah, it, it yeah. acts as an entity in which it's supposed to serve. Now, any member of that is kind of irrelevant to whatever concerns that might exist. It's just the fact of the matter is it was tabled yeah. till se September 14th. Yeah, two months. And that's horrible for yeah, us. It means that takes that, the steam out of any effort. And, yeah. Yeah. So wh that's the first item on the agenda, which is kind of like emergency, get this out of the way quick, vote yes on this, counselors. Okay. Um, the other couple are more long term. Um, and, you know, I'm still, I'm sure there are more. There are way more, but we're going to start with these. And one of them is the enact a property tax abatement for landlords and owners to lease to artists and arts and cultural organizations. Tie these property taxes, tax reductions to rental relief for those tenants. So again, tax abatement. Yeah. If you have a triple net lease, which a lot of nonprofits do because it's cheaper, you, you know, you're not responsible for paying taxes on it because if you owned your own space as a nonprofit, you wouldn't pay taxes on it. So why do I have to pay the landlord's taxes for him? That doesn't make any sense. So that's in there. Um, I'm not sure of any other municipalities who's have actually uh, passed this, but Somerville led with this in their petition on Mass Creative these past few weeks. Right. Um, so we can watch. Like Cambridge Somerville dance. We always do this, right? We do do this. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> <It's> like... <laughs> And Somerville does something, Cambridge does something, Cambridge does, you know, they, they chase each other. It's yeah. great motivation. I hope it works. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, a lot of the population of Cambridge moved to Somerville, you know, when we lost rent control in 94. Or, so, you know, that's part of the reason. Right. But, <laughs> yeah. but like, I'm a resident of Somerville. Right. I work in Cambridge. Right. There's a lot of us that go back and forth. I do the reverse. Next... Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. I mean, basically, <laughs> you know, so. Uh, and I'm on the board of <laughs> Somerville you. Media Center, even though I live in Cambridge. So go figure. But yeah. 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 It's all one thing in my viewpoint. It's only across the train tracks. 
Camberville, we typically call it, you know, uh, not, not know. Summer Bridge. We, we could call it that, but we don't. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. That, the that, other one. that sounds good. And yeah. those, is that, is that all three or is that two? No, 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 that's just two. And then there's a couple It's like, trying to get into the, not paralleling the affordable housing um, requirements that developers have to use, parallel, not not fighting against it at all in this way, but like kind of echoing that notion that any new developments should have a designated art space of some sort. Yeah, something I very much it. agree with. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, that, and it can't be a closet. Like right. that's which, one thing. Which they do pull. So. You know, it'd be like a, a rec closet, you know, with some paint in it, you know, like or something. Like you know. that's not going to be useful. a sock. You know. um, yeah. And then there's there's also something on the table from uh, uh, one of the counselors, Alana Mallon, had spearheaded along with uh, then Mayor Mark McGovern, the Arts Task Force, which took nine months to convene, discuss um, issues of arts in Cambridge <clears throat> and kind of go forward with like a cultural plan thinking it's not quite a cultural plan yet but like definitely like these are the objectives these are the roadblocks here are the objectives sure. like how yeah. can we fix this they put I, I don't have the orders with me right now that's okay I do, they're in the back oh okay <laughs> great. four to five orders i know it's just like take them out Ooh. um <laughs> four to tell. five orders that were put on the table in 2019 that were supposed to incentivize art making and facilities in cambridge um, unfortunately, they were all pretty much contingent on the hiring of the cultural planning director, um, which is still sitting on the desk of the city manager. Oh, so in no. This petition, <laughs> it's Cambridge's yeah, so like, greatest black a lot hole. Of money at play yeah, so, here. Yes, there there's is. There's like a lot of, in the, in the other orders, there was some money, you know, if a, if a developer can't pay to, or they can't put in parking requirements, they would have to use 50% of the money they would have paid to make those parking requirements and put them towards a fund right. for arts. Right. And I'm like, brilliant, yeah. but we can't get there yet because it's not in place yet because it hasn't been improved because the cultural planning director hasn't been hired. So the first step is to actually hire that <coughs> person that was recommended by the arts task force. Right. And that will allow all the other provisions hopefully to be on the table to actually be discussed and voted on. Um, whether or not they're the right ones, we don't know. You know, like they say so, which maybe it's true. I don't know. But that's something that's at play. And there is like the 1% rule from all new developments should go towards this fund. Well, the fund can't be accessed yet because we don't have a director yet. <laughs> a lot of catch 22s. Yes, the only catch there is, as the novel said. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, this is Cambridge. For those of you not familiar with Cambridge gov government, this is. This is how things work. I mean, the because we have this very bizarre style of, of government, the Plan E style, and I, I've written about it. It's many like many other up, people have written up about down, it. Upside down triangles. Uh, well, <laughs> basically, though, off to the side of the triangle is the city manager who has budgetary power, and he's, no, he's not in the an center. elected. Yeah. Okay. Sure. He's in the center of the. Yes, he's in the middle of the triangle, the upside down triangle. Um, but yeah. but yeah, our our councilors um, uh, don't have a lot of power. Uh, well. They do in the sense that they can hire or fire. They hire. They have hire fire power over the city manager, but they they don't use it. It's very very rare that they like even threaten to use it. Um, and the the man, you know, it's this silly dance that allows basically the powers that be, which include yes the councilors, but also the city manager, and Harvard and MIT who basically run the city, and other major corporations that also run the city to kind of do what they want to do and sort of keep the public at bay. Um, whether they, I mean, I'm not saying this is all mean-spirited. It's kind of like how stuff is sometimes. But a lot of good initiatives, I mean, initiatives that, that most people would have judged to be good by any metric, get stuck in this kind of pattern. You know, like, this is a new thing. This isn't what we normally do. The city manager is kind of a fiscal conservative and doesn't, you know, doesn't... They don't want to kill any geese that lay golden eggs. They don't want to like add more taxes of any kind that could be, or anything that could be read as taxes um, onto um, developers, landlords, companies, whatever. Because if, if, if those worthies stop coming to the city, stop doing stuff in the city, then the city's revenues will crash and 
we'll be like any other American city right now, which right now we're not. Cambridge has a lot of money. And that's, that's part of the catch 22. Like you, you know, the money's there, you know, the money's even, as you've already said, there are some pots already that are kind of there. They're, but, they're like, you know. but you can't take it. Right. <laughs> it's like there, you can't even I mean, it. I think it sounds like you're, you know, yeah. you're doing the right thing. I mean, it sounds like the, you know, the arts um, committee or commission is the right thing. I mean, we're, mm-hmm. we're journalists like myself are working on a journalism commission at the state level. That's kind of maybe a step earlier than where the arts folks are in Cambridge right now. Like we're just trying to get the commission to exist and we're about to find out whether that's going to even happen, even though it costs the state nothing. And then we're going to do the same thing. We're going to look at the situation of the collapse of local news in Massachusetts and then try to get the legislation legislators to do stuff that will that will improve the situation. Same thing, long process, but here we are in a crisis. Um, yeah. So, I mean, um, obviously uh, with, with Dick Boston, you know, we're happy to run op-eds we can also try to put reporters on to stuff like this i mean i, I i'm a, i'm arts editor among my other hats and uh, that's why i'm doing this series and, I, and i'm an artist if a kind of an active one uh it's sort of hard to spend 80 hours a week being a journalist and then also like oh i'm gonna do some art you know so journalism <laughs> is my art you know kelly so like um but i mean that that we can do so i hope that you can give me you know links to to petition and you know other stuff uh, any any relevant documents, and we can like put that stuff out there, you know, with this video, with the article that's going to accompany it, um, and f- hopefully that will help. Um, you know, is there anything else, um, you know, you have in mind for what we're going to be doing going forward in Cambridge and the Arts, you know, uh, until the pandemic's over and after the pandemic, or is that basically yeah. the game plan? Well, I mean, of course, I'll probably dream up new things, um, but there's one thing that is in it's on the table right now and that's a kind of a fun project where I have a campaign running called Say It Loud and Clear Mm -hmm. um, campaign in which artists and supporters can just submit either images, text, or video, short video, short text, you know, normal size image um, to me and I will project it onto the building next door um, over the course of a couple of months, as long as I could possibly stay in this building. Yeah, we haven't <laughs> really, I've kind of, li- I, I've sort of skipped that yeah, part. We, we, don't I don't... Need, we, we can dance around that a bit because right. it's a little weird, but um, so I will be displaying it on in the next door neighbor. The, their name is Dance Complex. I don't want to not say their name because there are another cultural I... institution in the square that's pretty prominent and dominant. I mean, they're Yeah, huge. no, I have great respect uh, for that. But they're not yeah. huge. They're right. just big. You know, it's an old they're, Odd they're Fellows trouble, Hall. Like, for those of you that don't know the space, yeah. it's, it's an old kind of quasi Masonic structure. It's interesting, yeah. and they and it's all filled yeah. with dancers. Um, right, but not so filled because it's not safe. So they only half filled. Not like, during the uh, pandemic. Oh, I, I did a yeah. really fun photo shoot there, you know, about three years ago. Yeah, so um, it's sad to see these places lying fallow, and to be under even more threat than they were. And do they own that space? Does their nonprofit own own that building? Uh, technically, know, so. yes. It was a long, drawn-out process of 25, 25 years um, wow. to get to actually. They weren't mature enough to actually get the mortgage at first. They had right. to have co-signers, <clears throat> and there's a big whoop de doo with the co I don't know, some drama. Right. Um, so they fought, they fought pretty hard um, to eventually get a mortgage on that um, wow. building. Wow. Um, before we finish up, I mean, any thoughts on one thing I bring up in my, when I started this series is, you know, um, especially in in light of the resurgence of the Black Lives Matter movement, uh, any thoughts on, on, you know, making the art scene more diverse? Is it, you know, any structural stuff you think we can do, you know, anything on your Mm -hmm. mind on that front? Um, it's interesting, um, to be sitting in this side of things where, you know, at Studio 550, 65% of our ongoing classes were run by teachers of people of color. Very interesting. Um, 65%. Yeah. Yeah. Because dance is a very interesting art form in some ways. Hmm. Be- because of the cultural traditions of <coughs> African Americans and Latinos and Asian cultures, like, it's inherent in their culture. And, and 
they practice it. You know, Americans don't really have much dance except like the classical, you know, phallic, well, right. the European tradition, but like modern dance originated in the United States. So people of all cultures were attracted to actually practicing that. It became a little bit more classist, a little bit more racist in a sense, because it was led not all, but like it got institutionalized. Right, and who had sure. access to institutions? And that's like the mostly white people, but you're dancing dances, you know, by Pearl Primus, <laughs> who is African American, right. which is weird. You know, like, <laughs> wait a who second. Who would have thought? Yeah. But, yeah, who would have thought? But in the dance world, I feel like we are. Uh, I don't want to say this because it's, it's not always true for everything. But we are diverse in if you look at the people who are actually practicing dance as a form. Right. Um, maybe more than other disciplines. Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean we're equal. Doesn't mean it's not the ra racism is there. It right. just means that the people that are practicing the art form are culturally diverse, but inherently because of the other traditions that are kind of coming in and out of it. So that's why I have 65% of people of color. And people of color lumped into this one box really blows my mind because right. I'm like, they, they don't belong in their one box. They're right. all different people. They're all from different cultures. It's a cultural tradition. It's not, and, but they make me check off the box, so I do it. I don't want to do it. I don't want to check off that box. I'm hearing that that phrase yeah. is going out of fashion, but I haven't heard what we're going to be replacing it with yet, so I'm like, uh, I know. I know. Well, like, like, I have to yeah. quantify it because the, you know, someone asked me to, a, a particularly an African-American person of concern was like, well, how many people of color do you have? And I was like, well, if you want me to lump them into the box, I you... will. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't really want to. Like, that's right. not helpful, especially asking them. It's like, oh, it's here. I don't want to do that. I mean, um, you know, can you, is this the kind of thing that can be talked out in a, in a, a, a discipline yeah. like dance, or, you know, like... Mm -hmm. I mean, should, should, could you do public fora? Have you done that kind of stuff? Would you do it? You know, that sort of thing. Other than that, I mean, I don't want to. I don't want to flog this. Oh yeah. You know, but but like, um, you know, I I wonder obviously, um, uh, having spent you know my my adult life as an active anti-racist, like you know, it this you can't. There's no one way to like make everything all better, right? There's and there's all mm -hmm. kinds of microaggressions and stuff that you know even somebody like me will do. You know, just because you're you're raised in this racist society, right. you're part of it. You're racist. I mean, one is if you're white, you're racist. You just got to work through it. You know, um, and uh, um, I, I, but I'm asking people, regardless, you know, that that this is going to be a muddling through thing. But I would mm -hmm. like to see the muddling through progress faster than it was before the pandemic mm -hmm. and the crises that it really accelerated structural racism being one of these sort of endemic crises in America yeah. um, that's now really front and center um, for, for a bunch of reasons that are even related to the pandemic, you know, where, where uh, black and Latino folks are, are, are getting slammed with uh, infection with coronavirus and getting COVID, you know, and getting very sick and dying at higher rates, partially because uh, black and Latino populations are poorer because of structural racism, among other reasons, you know? So like, um, so I don't know, you know, um, yeah. yeah, have anything more to I say mean, on that, go for it. But. There's a, yeah, there's, there's something else. I mean, there's something that, um, like I, so right at the edge of the pandemic, we had to make this decision about a program that I thought it was gonna happen, but ended up not being able to happen, which was a um, residency program at the studio. Right. And I made sure that whoever I brought on board understood the full scope, or even if they didn't understand quite, they, they took, they were very sensitive to the scope of what kind of submissions they would be getting. And we got quite a few hip hop from African American, mm. you know, dancer, dance makers. And I was so happy to see that the panel that I put together actually, you know, approached each application with the same amount of fairness. Um, mm. and, and lens shifting, so it's not just Eurocentric dance we're talking about. We're talking yep. about something that was originated here in the United States called hip hop. Yep. That you know people are practicing in very different ways and progressive ways. And our final um, selection included. You know what? Oh, I'm sorry. Could you hear that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wow, mute didn't work. Okay. Oh, no. 
I was just telling my wife uh, to just keep it down for a minute. <laughs> like, <laughs> damn. Well, I'm not in sight, so I can't. So, so yes, I, I'm living like everybody else, people. This brick wall is not real. I'm in an apartment. Okay, sorry. Go ahead. Finish your thought. Pardon me. It's, it's okay. That I just was really proud that the people that the artists that we actually chose, which we'll get to, by the way, we'll get to them. I just not right now. It's really hard. Um, we're divers as yeah. the applications that were actually received and didn't just focus on Eurocentric ideals. Um, not only ballet people got accepted, that actually no ballet people got accepted, <laughs> which was kind of cool. Um, so that's like one thing. And, and I was researching something in, oh, the dance professors online forum, transition group, Facebook group, which is a whole bunch of dance professors getting together going, what do we do now? Um, a lot of them are restructuring their um, programming and their coursework to include various cultures into their dance history classes, into their okay, yeah. academic classes. So then we have a better awareness as to how to gauge it and how to discuss it and how to incorporate it into the cultural art form of dance um, cool. as a whole versus ha being world dance as something special. And you're like, no, 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 that's a lot of stuff in that. We're gonna actually spread it out, put it together, like this is all of dance. We're gonna look at it from this lens. Um, and the ballet and the African diaspora from wherever, you know, like they have the same value. It's just they're done differently. <laughs> um, and we get to get those histories into our educational system as well. And I am hoping that keeps going, you know, that, that discussion keeps going so that starting from the education of the art form through institution, but can be somewhere else as well, traditional institution. Um, we, it's just normal. Yeah. You no, know, it's just part of it. That's, that's it. good. I like you it. Know, I mean, it's nothing that's, special. Right. <laughs> I mean, there is something special, it's but organic. it's not treated as the yeah. other. Yeah. No, you know? exactly. Yeah. That's the very tricky thing, the gestalt, like to, to, for people to get a hold of. Like this shouldn't be a special thing or a special conversation. This should just be like always on people's minds. And it sounds like, you know, your circles are on point on this. Uh, and that's that's nice to hear. And I mean, that does kind of get at my question uh, as as, you know, your other points about um, the situation trying to get more money, uh, you know, into the arts in in one city. But, uh, you know, also th this this struggles okay. happening everywhere at the same time so that when we come out of this pandemic, you know, we're going to be able to build a stronger art scene, you know. Yeah. Um, and I think learning from each other, I think communicating with each other is super important for that because once you start doing it in one community, you can, you know, at least use that model for another community. Yeah. And be like, hey, it's worked over here. Why That's don't right. we try it over here? Yeah. And then that gives incentive to try it because it worked over there, you know, like, so yeah. let's try it, you know, let's get this done. Which um, is a good reason for us to cover this stuff because, I mean, like with our journalism work in Somerville, I keep saying that we're trying to historicize and theorize what we're doing as we go along so it's replicable. Because mm -hmm. like one nonprofit is not going to do this all over Massachusetts or all over the US in the journalism scene. Same with the art scene, yeah. right? So it's got to be like, you know, uh, it's, it spreads by networking. It spreads because people see what's working and what isn't working and then they try it in their own communities, right? Yeah. Um, interestingly, we got, we did get a couple, a couple of, uh, uh, dig fans commenting, um, oh. you know, I, I mean, not just, just saying, you know, that they're, well, Nina La Negra, who you may know, I, I know her, um, said, thank you for doing this. I'm very much interested in this conversation. Jason Premis will check this later, uh, on my way to an, a butters meeting. Oh, cool. And then George Hassett, who writes for dig sometimes said, dig Boston is the best. Oh, that's nice. Thank you. And I could, I could type. See, I haven't done this before. I wasn't even sure this was active. Thanks, folks. You know, like submission for it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so um, um, I guess we should uh, we should wrap up. Um, let me just ask you, um, um, and certainly give any final thoughts too. But um, if folks want to donate to, uh, and is it Studio at five fifty or Studio five fifty? How do we how do we say it? Both ways. I noticed you said it's Studio, studio 550. at 550. Okay. I know it's weird. I know it's weird, <laughs> but that's what the name of the organization. But if folks want to donate, I mean, I mean, certainly you can give me links and stuff to add to our, uh, you know, to uh, the video and and to uh, uh, the, the article we're putting out. But it, you know, is there anything you want to say here that people can do if they're just watching the video? Yeah, I mean, if you want to donate, you can go to www.studioat.at 
550.org. Um, we have a COVID relocation fund because we have to actually move out of our building. Oh, <laughs> we just don't know where oh. we're moving to. Oh. Um, yeah, so we kind of need money to do that because that costs money. It does. Um, yeah. Yeah. Wow. Um, yeah, and also um, Central, excuse me, hold on a second. I'm going to cough. Um, stu- uh, Central Square Arts, but centralsqarts.org um, is our center platform for all advocacy um, information and you can also sign on as a partner and that just means that you support it and you're involved by listing your name but also and then you're included in the email so we can, then you can actually engage in our meetings which so far has been every couple of weeks. Um, we've had one meeting, now we're going to have another meeting oh, next cool. week. Um, and anybody's welcome to join to discuss the topic is at hand, ideas, um, interest in being involved, and all the rest of it. So that's centralsqarts.org is the other site that you can visit, not just for monetary donations, but actually engagement. Okay. Great. And uh, anything else you'd like to say? Ooh, probably, but I'll, I'll keep it there. <laughs> we'll demure for the moment. All right. Yeah. Well, Callie Chapman of Studio at 550 in Central Square in Cambridge, Mass., thank you so much for being uh, with us today. This has been, uh, you know, Dig Boston's uh, second Better Boston Arts segment, and uh, thank you so much for participating. It's great having you. Thank you, Jason. We'll wave to folks, and you. you can stay on for a moment. I'm going to turn off the feed, but bye, everybody. Bye. Finish. Bye.